And then I cry, what wonderful grace, what wonderful grace. This is brought to you by people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the word of truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us today for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. Well, we're certainly glad to have you with us again today, and we trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you. We're going to look into the Word of God again today, and we're going to begin a series of studies in our, in our uh, meetings with you each week here. Uh, I'm, we're going to call it Through the Bible in Seven Hours. Uh, my goal is to have you to be able to, in just a short period of time, have a strategic grasp of God's Word. Now, somebody told me, said, well, Brother Rick, you can't study, you can't learn the Bible in seven hours. I didn't say we're going to learn the Bible completely and totally and everything in it. You'll spend all eternity learning God's Word, but you can get a strategic grasp of God's Word, and it doesn't take forever. And in our next few weeks together, we're going to, you're going to begin to learn some information that will help you get a strategic grasp of the Bible for yourself, uh, and it won't take forever. We're going to do it in seven hours. Now, this is a half-hour program. And uh, so I'm going to do one session and then another session. That'll be one hour. One session, another session, that'll be two hours. And we're going to do that seven times. So we'll have uh, more, than one, more than seven programs together because it's, you know, half an hour is only half an hour. And we're not going to call an hour an hour if it's not an hour. But I want you to be able to grasp and understand. There, there's, there's some fundamental keys to reading and studying and understanding God's Word that allows you to grasp it and understand it for yourself. If you ask the average person, uh, or if you ask anyone, what, what, do you, what kind of tools do you need to begin to study God's Word? You know, someone would say, well, you need, a, you, you need a Bible, and then you need a concordance, and uh, maybe a Greek and an English concordance and dictionary, and you need some commentaries by Bible teachers. Somebody else would say, well, but you need, you know, you need uh, the clergy, and you need those who have a special calling from God to teach the Bible. Somebody else says, forget it, it's useless, you can't understand the Bible, there's just too many confusing things in it. And so you get all these kind of ideas, but God has, has some tools uh, that he has provided for you and me that give us the ability not only to possess God's Word, but to grasp it and understand it for ourselves. I hope you'll be with us the next few weeks. And by the way, we do have a study guide that you could, you could call us and, 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 uh, or write us and, and get for yourself and follow along with us uh, as we go. Uh, they, they'll put that on the screen for you as the program goes on. There'll be a phone number there. You can call call this week and you'll have it for uh, the next week or so to study right along with the lessons. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about a lot of different topics. I'll only be able to use a couple of verses. There could be another dozen that would be in the study guide to help you go through that information. Our desire is to help you to understand and enjoy God's Word and anything we can do in that way to help you. So if you like the study guide, uh, through the Bible in seven hours, you, you call us and request that. We'll be sure that you get a copy so that you'll be able to study with us as we matriculate through these, these lessons. Take your Bible, if you will, and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Uh, there are four important tools uh, to understanding God's Word. And I, like I said, a lot of folks would say, well, you need a concordance, you need a dictionary, you need, you know, all these kind of things. And, and all those things are, are nice. But there's the, 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 there are four specific things that, that you have to have. And the one great thing that you need, the first thing that you need, the thing that's of paramount importance, is to be the proper student. Uh, you, you have to have the, be the proper student of God's Word before you can actually grasp God's Word. There's a lot of difference between reading God's Word and studying God's Word. There's a lot of difference between studying it and understanding it. And there's one great requirement that God himself has, has uh, uh, provided for us to be a, the teacher of his Word. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. And by the way, that great requirement, the first thing you have to have, you have to be the proper student. And the way that you become a proper, the proper student of the Word of God is someone who has confidence that he possesses the indwelling Holy Spirit of God to be his teacher. You see, I teach the Bible 
I'm a Bible teacher. A lot of people teach the Bible, but there really is only one person that can teach you God's Word. When I teach, you need to look and see, search and see, don't take it from me. You need to go to the Scriptures because the Spirit of God wrote His Word. And so the Spirit of God that wrote the Word has to be the one who teaches you in your inner man. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 9, Paul says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Notice there are things that your eye and your ear and your heart can't perceive. Your eye is what you see. We call that empiricism. Your ear is what you hear. We call that reasoning. And, and your, your, your heart, man, with heart man believes. We call that faith. And with the eye, the eye gate, empiricism, the scientific method of observation and rep, uh, repeatable uh, events, the, the ear gate, the, the gate of reason and ration and thinking, and the faith gate, the heart gate, with those things, the capacity you and I, we can't find out God. So then how would you know him? But God hath revealed. You see, God has made himself known to us. And the way he did it is by his Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that reveals God to us. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a, of, of a man, save the Spirit of a man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You see, God the Holy Spirit is the teacher. And to study God's Word, the first requirement, the first thing you have to do to understand the Scripture is to have confidence that you have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God as your indwelling resident teacher. Well, then the question comes, how can I know for sure that I have the Spirit of God dwelling in me? Well, come to Ephesians chapter number 1, because he wrote a verse of Scripture in the Bible just to answer that question. And it says nothing about what church you go to. It says nothing about what creed or confessional you uh, agree to or don't agree to. Anything about your religion. It doesn't say anything about your activity, what you, what you gave up, what you quit doing, what you started doing, how, how good you are, how bad you aren't. Listen to what he says. Ephesians 1, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In, which also, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which, uh, uh, Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest. I'm going to get the chalkboard out here because I don't want you to miss what this verse is saying. Notice, notice what he says here. In whom you also trusted. You've trusted in Christ. The last part of verse 12, it says, talks about those who first trusted in Christ. After that, you heard the word of truth. So here's the order. First, you had to hear the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. You hear the gospel of your salvation. Then, in whom also, after, you, after that, after you heard, you did what? You believed. Well, what did you believe? Well, you believed the gospel, the gospel of your salvation. Now, what happens after you hear God's word? Here comes the Spirit of God with his word. He wrote the word. You believe it. You give that positive response to the, to the doc. What happens? Well, after you believe it, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You're sealed, and notice it says, not by, but with. The Holy Spirit is what seal, is who seals you. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He literally comes and implants himself into your spirit and becomes the earnest of our inheritance. He becomes the down payment of our eternal life. 
we hear the word, we hear the gospel of your salvation, you believe the word, and when you believe it, then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. So how do you know, how can you know for absolute sure and confident that you have the proper indwelling resident teacher of God's word? Well, you know it objectively. You don't have to say, well, I, I, I believe my church is the right church. Or, Brother Rick, I go to church and I tithe. And, Brother Rick, I don't do that. You don't have any of that kind of stuff. All that's subjective. All of that is something that may or may not be just your opinion or somebody else like you's opinion. And you know what they say about opinions. They're like armpits. Everybody's got two of them and none of them, none of them are, well, anyway. You hear, the, you hear the gospel. You believe the gospel. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. How can you have confidence that you have the indwelling Holy Spirit? Well, you hear the gospel, you believe the gospel, and you're sealed. What is that gospel that when you hear it and believe it causes the Holy Spirit to come in and seal you? Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, writing to the Corinthians, says, Moreover, brethren, I, I declare unto you that gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which you are saved. Here's the gospel that when you hear it and believe it, it saves you. The Holy Spirit then seals you. You're sealed with the, with the Holy Spirit. What is that gospel? Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, and he was buried, and he was raised again the third day, according to the Scripture. Notice there are four or five things there. Number one, he died for our sins. You know what that means? That means you're a sinner. That means sin separates you from God. Listen, you can go to church all your life and try to convince everybody in the world that you're okay and that you're really not as bad a guy as everybody thinks you are and, and, and all that kind of business. You can look around any room you go in, you can find somebody better, you know, worse than you are, and you can point out, point them. Problem with that is, when you compare yourself among yourself, keep looking around that room, you find somebody better than you. They're pointing at you, that you're not good as they are. You know what the book says? The book says there's not a just man that on, on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Friend, it's not comparing you with me or me with you or us with somebody else or somebody else with us. It's comparing you with God. You're not as perfect as Jesus Christ, and you know it. Well, if you're going to go to heaven when you die, you have to be perfect, and you know that, and you aren't. So the first thing in the good news is really bad news, is that we, we've got some sin that needs to be dealt with, and the wages of sin is death. That's what comes because of your sin. So the first thing I believe when I hear the gospel is that I'm a sinner and my sin separates me from God. And then he says that Christ died for my sins. Jesus Christ did what? The wage of sin is death. The only answer for death is life. So Jesus Christ does what? God commends his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice what that verse says. While we were yet sinners... That means you weren't trying to make it better, you weren't trying to fix it, you weren't trying to get it, you know, you weren't trying to repent and show God how, how sorry you were. You were going on in your merry way, your sinful, rebellious, self-interested way, living in your own autonomy, doing it your way, not caring about anything anybody else said, and when they said something, rebel against it, make excuses for it. And in your condition of being a rebel against God, helpless, hopeless rebel, he says in that passage in Romans 5 that in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He says, did you get that? When we were without strength, he died for the ungodly. Couldn't help ourselves. When we were yet, yet sinners, what's he do? He dies. He pays for your sin debt. You want to know where the love of God is? The love of God is, if you want to see God's love, look to Calvary. Don't look to your bank account. Don't look to the status of your health or your romantic life. Don't look how the world or somebody else is treating you. Look to the cross. That's where God demonstrates, has demonstrated, 2,000 years ago in the objective reality of human event, prove without any question that he loved you by coming to Calvary and paying your sin debt. The guilt, the shame, the penalty and all the rest for your sin, he paid for it at Calvary. Christ died for our sins. Then it says he was buried. 
When it says he's buried, it means two things. It means, number one, he was really dead. This is not a figment of imagination. This is not some, some swooning hallucination of some religious figure. He was dead, stone cold, dead on the market. Boom. It was reality. But when they buried him, they took him out of the way. That pictures the fact that Jesus Christ took our sins away. They're done away with, put out of sight, out of God's sight, out of our sight. And then he was raised. There's life. There's forgiveness right there, paid for him. There's life. You see, the only answer for death is life, and there you have it. You know what that is? He says he was raised for our justification. That means it's paid in full. That's what that means. You ever go pay for gas at the gas pump, put your credit card in, when you get through to say you want a receipt, and you say yes, and you get the receipt, and the receipt says, I paid for it. I'm not a drive away, I paid for it. Got proof. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is proof, historically demonstrated in the reality of human event, that his death put away sin. If he hadn't completely put away all of your sins, death would have held him. When he came up from the dead, that proved the receipt that's paid in full. And now he can be, now you can trust him to be your life. Now when you trust and you believe the gospel of your salvation, you believe that Jesus Christ died because you were a sinner and your sin separated you from God, going to put you in hell in the lake of fire for eternity. But Jesus, God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He put away our sin by the sacrifice of himself, and he was raised to give us his life. When you trust him to be the Savior, he died and rose again to be. The moment you do that, God the Holy Spirit comes and seals you with himself. You know how you can know for sure you have the real teacher of the Word of God? You have the real teacher because you believe the gospel of your salvation. Your faith is resting in what God says, not what you do. So the first issue is that God requires for understanding his word is to acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you can't save yourself, realize that the payment must be made for your sin, and that Jesus Christ at Calvary died to pay the penalty for your sins in, the, in his blood on the cross, and then you simply rely, you believe, you rely exclusively on him to be the Savior. You rely exclusively on his death, burial, and resurrection to be your complete payment, total payment for your sins, and your only hope of, of having eternal life as a present possession and in heaven. And once you've done that, God gives you his Holy Spirit to indwell you, and that Holy Spirit then is the teacher of his word. Now once you've got that, come with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Because you not only need the, to be the proper student, you need to have the proper scriptures. You, you need the scriptures, you need the word of God, not just anybody, not just any book. 2 Timothy 3, 16, Paul says, All scriptures given by inspiration of God. Let's well, start in verse 15. And this from a child, that from a child that has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. For all scriptures given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Notice, you need to have the Spirit of God as your resident and dwelling teacher. How's he going to teach you? He's going to teach you through the Scripture, through the words that he wrote. Then you need to have those words. You need to have confidence that you have a book that is the book that God the Holy Spirit wrote. Now we call that inspiration. That word inspire. Generally speaking, you hear that word de defined as uh, God breathed. And that's okay. Uh, because uh, that, that's a good definition. Jesus said in Matthew chapter number 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that's God's breath. But notice this word, inspiration. You see the word there, the word in, and then you see there the word spirit. And then when you make the noun out of it, that's the condition of being having God's Spirit in it. What the Word of God is, there's the words that God, the Holy Spirit, placed in a book. That's God's Word. 
That's what inspiration is about. It's the words that came out of the mouth of God. But you go into Mark 12 and Acts 1, Acts 25, where you find Jesus, Peter, and Paul, and they'll they refer to an Old Testament and say, the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spake, and then they'll quote the Psalms. The Holy Spirit by the mouth of Isaiah wrote, and they'll quote the book of Isaiah. God the, Jesus, Peter, and Paul thought God the Holy Spirit wrote those books. That's called inspiration, God writing them down. Now, once he wrote them down, there's a doctrine of preservation. He didn't just write them down, but he wrote them down in order that they might be preserved through history. Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 8, for example. Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 8. When God told Isaiah to, write his, to, to send his, um, his word to the nation Israel, he said it like this. Isaiah 30, verse 8. Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. Notice that God wanted them to take a passage. He wanted to write it down in a book. Why? That it might be preserved. When they wrote it down and they preserved it, what God wrote down in inspiration, he then preserves. I erased it. I can't point to it. He preserved. How did they do that? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, he told him when Moses began to write the Bible, he says, make copies of it. Give it to the king. Make copies of it. Give it to the priest. You keep the, they kept the originals in the ark, but then they made copies for people to read. You see, he wants his word preserved and distributed. That's how you preserve it. Matthew chapter 22, verse 31, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, rather, here, he, uh, the religious leaders of Israel, in his earthly ministry, Matthew 22, verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, you, you do err, not knowing the Scripture, nor the power of God. How about that? Got some religious leaders that don't know the Bible, that don't know God's power. Verse 31, but as touching the resurrection, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God? Now look at here. He's going to quote, Exodus chapter number 3. Moses back here. Moses says some things in Exodus 3. Jesus Christ, uh, over here, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his earthly ministry in the book of Matthew, is going to quote, in Matthew 22, he's going to quote Exodus 3. And he says, have you not read... That which was spoken to you back here. Now, do you think those guys had the original manuscripts? No, they didn't have the original manuscripts of Exodus 3. They had copies of it that they could read. They could hold in their hand with confidence. Jesus said they could. Isaiah said, go write it in a book that it might be preserved. Here it is preserved. For 1,500 years, right here. And Jesus said they can read it. Don't you ever let anybody tell you the only place you can find God's Word is in the original manuscripts, which are all gone. The Protestant confessions of faith until the 20th century all said that God wrote His Word and then has preserved it intact through history so that we can have it in our hands. That's the kind of confidence. You need to know what you're studying is really the Word of God. Now you say, well, how am I going to know that? That the book I have in my hand is the Word of God with the confidence, same confidence Christ had that the Word one he had in his hands were that. Well, if God has promised to you to preserve his Word, come with me to Mark chapter number 1. If God has promised to preserve his Word, then you know that you, you should be able to find it. And by the way, you remember the first question that, that, that Satan asked when he showed up in Genesis 3? Yea, hath God said... Is your version of what God said really what God said? He asked Eve, do you have the right Bible? Do you have the right word from God? 2 Corinthians 2.17, Paul talks about some people. He said, we're not as many which corrupt the word of God. Every Bible isn't reliable. Only some of them are. You say, well, how would you know? Mark chapter 1, verse 2. When I say to you on this program week after, and I know I'm alone. I'm, a, I'm the lone voice in the wilderness, crying like a voice crying in the wilderness. When I tell you that the the only English Bible you can absolutely trust and have confidence when you hold it in your hand that it's the Word of God is the King James Bible. Let me show you how you can know that for yourself. Mark chapter one verse two, as it is written in the prophets. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall, be, which shall prepare thy way before thee, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. 
Now, if your Bible that you're reading in verse 2 said, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, it's wrong. Because the quote, look at the, look at the margin, the note in your Bible, the quote is from Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 40 verse 3. It's from two prophets, Malachi and Isaiah, and the verse in verse 2, Behold, I send my man, is not, in, is not in Isaiah anywhere. It's only in Malachi. So you've got one of two choices in the Bible you're using. If it says Isaiah, either the Word of God isn't complete because the verse is left out of Isaiah, or Mark 1, 2 is not infallible, it's wrong. Well, I know the Bible is complete, and I know the Word of God is infallible, so you know what I know? I know the Bible you're reading isn't infallible, trustworthy Word of God. The only... Right, and get the handout because there's dozens of these verses to look at. So you can check for, don't take my word, check and see, don't take it from me. When you've got in your hand the King James Bible, you've got the Word of God in your language, you can have confidence in that. If you trust exclusively in Jesus Christ, you can have confidence that the indwelling Holy Spirit is in you to teach you the Word that He's preserved for you. Now next week we're going to go on with two more tools that when you add the four together, give you the foundation upon which the Spirit of God then can take His Word and begin to illuminate your mind with it, with understanding. Thanks for being with us today. Till next time, Maranatha. Well, we're certainly glad you've joined us again today. We trust that our time together will be a rich blessing and help to you as we continue in a series of studies that we've, we've entitled uh, Through the Bible in Seven Hours. Now, you know this is only a half-hour program, so we're obviously not doing seven hours in one program. And you also can't get through the Bible completely in, in, in Bible understanding in seven hours. What we're trying to do is provide a strategic grasp of God's Word for you so that you can understand the Bible for yourself. Can I say to you, you don't need to know Hebrew, you don't need to know Greek, you don't need a you don't college education, you don't need a preacher that's got all of that. God has equipped you through, the, through His Word to understand His Word, and there's some keys to understanding God's Word that will give you a strategic grasp of what's going on in Scripture that gives you the ability to understand it for yourself. And we're, gonna, we, we're, we're going to be uh, looking at this now for the next few weeks. We've already seen, had one study. We're going to continue today with the, first, the second half of the first hour. The last week we began... Uh, looking at the keys to, to, to understanding the Bible. And I said to you there are four uh, special keys to understanding God's Word. We looked at two of them last week. One is the student. You have to be the proper, you have to have the proper teacher-student relationship. The student has to be one who has the indwelling Holy Spirit of God as his teacher. How do you get the Holy Spirit? We saw last time. How, do you, how can you know for, with confidence that you have that indwelling, resident Spirit of God to teach you? You get that? Ephesians 1, verse 13, you remember? You hear the gospel of your salvation, that Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day. You believe that. You, you, you understand that you're a sinner, you're separated from God on your own. You're only deserving and worthy of death and hell, the lake of fire. But God commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid our sin debt. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How can he do that? Because God commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid for all that's wrong with us, took it out of the way. That's what the burial is about. He's taking it away. And then he was raised for our justification. He's raised as the receipt that says the debt is paid in full. When you rely exclusively on Jesus Christ to be the Savior that He died and rose again to be, God the Holy Spirit comes and seals you with His own presence. And then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption. Now that's what God's Word, when you trust God's Word on it, God says, I'll give you my Holy Spirit as your teacher. Then you have to have the Scripture. And we tried to show you last week that the Word of God, the written Word of God is the Scripture. God inspired it. He also preserved it through history. And you can have it in your hands with confidence when you hold the King James Bible in your hand. You can't have the same kind of confidence when you use other modern versions that you can have when you hold the King James Bible. And I gave you verses last week to show you that. Today I want to move on because there's a third key element. Come, come with me, if you will, to the book of 2 Timothy. 
The third key element is the study. First you have the student, proper student, then you have the proper scripture, now you want to have the proper study. Second Timothy 2.15, Paul says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can, you can get some, some knowledge from the scripture by reading it, just by reading. In fact, I'll confess to you that I read the Bible through from cover to cover at least twice a year, and I've done that for over 40 years. And I do that just to have put the knowledge and the information in my mind. But if you're going to really understand it, get a grasp of it, you have to do more than just read it. You have to study it. And it's important to understand that studying God's, Bible, God's Word is where meditating it, thinking about it, putting it in your heart, rolling it over in your mind, studying it, putting the effort involved. I know, Ecclesiastes says, much study is awareness to the flesh. You'd rather be entertained. You go to the average church today, and it's just a, a big entertainment uh, uh, session. You go to the average church today, you can unscrew your head, leave it in the parking lot, lock it in the glove compartment, you're going to need it when you go home, but you won't need it in church. Well, can I tell you, friends, your Christian life won't operate on the basis of ignorance? And, and understanding God's Word won't operate on talking about God's Word. It operates because you get in God's Word and you study it. Now, there are three golden questions for you to ask. I'm going to get the chalkboard out so I can write them up here and you can write them down. There are three key questions for you to ask when you begin to study God's Word. There are three, Dr. Henry Gruber, Gruber called them golden questions to Bible understanding. One, when you start reading the Bible, you want to ask yourself, who is speaking? Who's talking? Number two, you want, you want to know two whom are they talking? And number three, you want to know when were they talking? So you say who, to whom, and when. Who? Why is that important? Well, if you go in your Bible to Genesis chapter number three, and Satan, speaking to Eve, says, Thou shalt, you eat of the fruit of the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil, Thou shalt not surely die. Now that's what God's Word says. It's recorded in Genesis chapter 3. Thou shalt not surely die. Well, in chapter 2, God said, if you do, you will surely die. Somebody says, well, that's a contradiction in the Bible. Well, it's a difference of opinion, that's for sure, but it's not a contradiction in the sense that the Bible's wrong. Why? Because God said one thing and Satan said the other. Do you think it might help you to know who said what you're reading? I mean, you could say, well, there's a verse of Scripture. I think, you know, all the, ver all, all the verses in the mind, all the, all the Bible's mine. I can I, you know, all, everything in it's mine. All the promises in the Bible are mine. I'll just claim any of them and just like a smorgasbord. Well, you run down through Genesis 3 and you take that promise from Satan. You think it's going to work for you? Well, how's any of his promises ever worked out for you? <laughs> you know, it, Satan's a good paymaster. He pays out. The coinage he pays in is death. So it makes, it's important to ask, who's saying this? In, in, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, wouldn't it, wouldn't it help you to know if God said it? Or if someone else? Who? It's important to know who said it. It's important to know who did they say it to? Look with me at 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Here's a verse of scripture that you hear quoted constantly in political circles. People who have come along and, and, and fed you this, this, this hallucination that, um, you know, that God is favoring America over all, of, all the other nations in the earth because you know, of our founding fathers and all that kind of business. Listen, in the Declaration of Independence, I, by the way, I'm red, white, and blue, glad to be American, true and true. Not a pink bone in me anywhere. But I'm not a dummy. And I'm not a politicalist. And I'm not a statist. And I'm not a corporatist. I'm a Bible believer. Bible believing Christian. And when I read the, you know, uh, the whole purpose of our, uh, is to provide life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, there's nothing biblical about that. You know the kind of freedom 
that people want when they talk about political freedom and we want to be you know, the, home, the land of the free and the home of the brave. They're talking about freedom to do whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it, any way they want to do it. And that's not freedom. That's not the Romans 6 freedom. That's not the freedom of the Bible. Just to go out and do anything you want to do any way you want to do it and whenever you want to do it. That's not freedom. And if you don't know that, you don't know enough to discuss it. We're the Lord's free men. And Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 7 in the context where, where if you're a slave in a cell, you can still be freer than a guy walking the streets with money in his pocket. There's a spiritual freedom. Well, I say that so that you understand when people want to use the Bible for political means and to promote their liberal political causes or their conservative political causes, they always twist the scriptures. Okay? Now, the Bible's got a lot to say about politics. You know what the Bible says about the future of this planet and the governments of this planet? It says they're going to be screwed up until Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom. And the only hope for the, for the governmental, economic, social, political, and ecological uh, salvation of this planet is the, set, is the kingdom that Jesus Christ will set up on this earth when he returns. Now, how about that for a political statement? Till then, do the best you can, you're going to lose. You know, people say, you believe in putting politics? That's not politics, that's Bible. See? Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive them and heal their land. And you hear that, you hear that belched out all over, don't you? You hear good, godly, concerned Christians quoting that verse like it's going to do any good. You know, they've been doing that for 200 years and hadn't done any good yet, has it? No. Did you ever notice what it says? If my people which are called by my name, who's he talking to? Well, if you go back to verse 12, the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself. You know what place that is? That's the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not in the United States of America. It's not in Europe. It's not in Asia. Jerusalem is in, well, you know where it's at. It's in Israel. You say, well, but did he really mean, you know, if he didn't really mean it, why didn't he say what he meant? If he didn't mean Jer every map you've ever seen, Jerusalem's in the Middle East. It's in Israel. Who did he say that to? It's important to know who he said it to. Or you're going to wind up in total confusion. By the way, Ephesians chapter 1, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Who did he say that to? He didn't say that to these people who are trying to get their land healed. He said that to members of the body of Christ. It's important to notice to whom he said, and it's also important to notice when it was said. Because if you don't, if you don't follow when it was said, you might wind up in a mess. Come with me to Exodus chapter 35. Here's a verse I, I, I love. I, I was born and raised in Alabama. And all my life, back in the, in the 60s and the 70s, I used to hear people say, well, you know, preacher, we've got to get out at 12 because the roast is burning and we've got lunch cooking. But they also call Sunday the Christian Sabbath. Well, listen, listen here. Exodus 35. Moses gathered all the, children of Israel, all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord has, has commanded, that ye should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall, be, uh, it, it, there shall be to you a holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. You know what happens if you work on, on the Sabbath day? You're to be put to death. Now that's, kind of, that's more serious than cutting, the gra cutting your grass on Sunday. That's if you worked on the Sabbath day, you're to be executed. Now watch the next verse. Exodus 35, 3. You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitation upon the Sabbath day. You know what? You can't even go, Mama, you can't even go to the kitchen and light the stove. Fella, you can't go to the microwave and punch up the 90 seconds and heat your coffee or your instant grits. No work, and if you kindle a fire, you're dead meat. See, it's cheap to talk about keeping the Sabbath. It didn't, it didn't quite so wonderful when you get these regulations back here and you read them. You say, but what do you do with that? 
Hey, if you, would re if you don't recognize that that's written to Israel, by, it's written by Moses to Israel in time passed under the law, well, you'd have a problem. You see, folks, if you can't, if you can't understand these, these, these simple little questions, you're going to wind up with absolute confusion in your Bible study. You start out studying your Bible, ask yourself, who wrote it? Who did he write it to? And when did he write it? What's the context of the timing involved? Now, in connection with those three golden keys, there are three guiding principles that you need to have when you're reading the Bible. Come with me to Nehemiah chapter number 8. There are three guiding principles. First of all, when you study the Bible, you want to follow the literal principle. If the, if, the, if, the, if the normal sense of a passage makes sense, then you don't need to seek any other sense. Do the Bible the favor of reading it like you read any other piece of literature that you read, anything you write or that you read. Don't go off on some hypnotic, superstitious journey of trying to find some hidden, secret, covert meaning with some code involved. You don't need any secret codes. Just, re just give the Bible the literal meaning that common sense tells you. Nehemiah chapter 8, they found the book, they lost the book, they found the book. Verse 8, it says, Nehemiah's reading it to them. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. You see, they just gave it the normal understanding. We call that the literal method of, of studying the Bible, literal interpretation. You just give it the normal meaning. Come with me to Luke chapter 1. Let me show you where this is, can be important. In Luke chapter 1, verse number 30 to 33, here's a passage that it could be very important with. Luke chapter 1, verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou art conceived in thy womb, or thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign forever. I'm sorry, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, when you read that passage, and I had a professor one time tell me, he says, Well, Brother Rick, Verse 32, when he says that he'll reign over the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob, that that's figurative. That we're the throne of David, and we're the house of Jacob. Now, I don't know what genealogy you follow. Get on the internet and trace your, your heritage, but it ain't going to go back to David, dollars against donut holes. And it's not going to go back to Jacob, dollars against donut holes. Mine sure doesn't, and that professor's didn't. But he says, well, that we, we spiritualize that. We understand that Israel really means the body of Christ, the church, and, and David really means Christ. And You see, every major denomination in Protestantism, all of the Catholic seminaries you can ever find, all of the schools associated with them, spiritualize that passage and say, David doesn't mean David. Jerusalem doesn't mean Jerusalem. The throne of David doesn't mean the throne of David. Literally, it's all spiritual. But look, if that's, if that's to be spiritualized, then what about verse 32, verse 31, conceive in thy womb as you bring forth a son, and verse 35, when it talks about the virgin conceiving. If one part of the verse is not to be taken literally, why would you take the other part, the virgin birth, literally? That's why people don't take the virgin birth literally in a lot of the places I just mentioned. You see, that passage has a sense. It makes sense if you, let it, if you just give it the sense that it makes. Now come with me to John chapter number 1. You don't, need to, you don't need to be spiritualized in those passages. They make sense just like they are. House of David means house of David. Why? That's just what it means in the Bible. Now here's one, John 1, 29. The next day John, that's John the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now when he said the Lamb of God, pointing to Jesus, 
Was Jesus a four-legged bat with wool on his back? No, he wasn't a four-legged lamb. wasn't a four-legged animal. He was a man standing there, the God-man. But John says he's the Lamb of God. Well, wait a minute. That's what we call a figure of speech. That's a metaphor. He uses a, a figure, the Lamb of God, to describe the function and work of the person of Jesus Christ. This person who's standing there is going to be, he's going to function as the Lamb of God. And that's a metaphor. Now, when you read that verse, you know that's what it is. You see, the common sense reading of that verse tells you it's a, it's a metaphor. So in one sense, you take it literally, it's literally a metaphor. Why? Because common sense tells you that. In Revelation chapter 1, he talks about the stars. Verse 20, he says, the stars are angels. Daniel chapter 7, he gives you all those beasts. Then he says, the four beasts are kings which shall arise. Well, see, when he takes the metaphor and interprets it, the interpretation is literal of the metaphor. You just read the Bible with common sense. That's what I'm saying to you. The second thing is, You compare Scripture with Scripture. The Scripture is its own best interpreter. When you've got a verse over here and you don't understand it, look for another verse over there. Second Peter chapter 1, it says, No Scriptures of any private interpretation. That doesn't mean you can't in interpret and understand it. It means you don't take one Scripture, take it out of its context, and the issue here is going to be context. And a, context, a text without a context is a pretext. And the context of the scripture is going to be other scripture. Either the near context or the remote context, but it's going to be God's word that makes the interpretation for you. You take, for example, Matthew 24, verse 13. In Matthew 24, 13, Jesus Christ says, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now, somebody comes along and quotes that verse to you, takes it out of its context. What's its context? Well, the next verse, he talks about the preaching of the kingdom of, of, of heaven, extending to the ends of the world. And the next verse, Matthew 24, verse 15, he talks about when you see the abomination spoken of by Daniel stand in the holy place. What's that? That's the middle of the seventh week of Daniel. Then he goes on down to verse 22, and he says, if, if these days aren't short, no flesh shall be saved. So in the context of he that endureth to the end shall be saved, the end is the end of the seventh week of Daniel, and the salvation is a physical salvation. If you read the context, the verse makes sense. But if you take it out of the context, you don't compare it with the other verses, you'll never get it. But if you do, it makes Bible study exciting. The third principle is the principle of dispensational Bible study. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, that one brings me to... Distinguishing the things that God has made different in His Scripture. That's what this is. So the way you read your Bible, to understand it, when you come to a passage, you ask who's talking, to whom are they talking, when do they say it. You read the passage literally, honoring and recognizing the metaphors, figures of speech, but read it just in the normal sense of the way. You compare, you look in the context, the near context, the remote context, you look for the explanation in the Scripture itself, comparing Scripture to Scripture, and then you study the Bible dispensationally. That brings me to the issue of the secret. You got the student, the Scripture, the study, and the secret. And when I say secret, I'm not talking about some code you have to find hidden in the scripture. I'm talking about what we talk to you about all the time. There's a, the basic division in your Bible is between what the Bible calls prophecy and the mystery, the secret. Acts 3.21, Peter says that he's speaking about that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. Paul says he's preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. There isn't any way that you can't understand that that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began, and that which is kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, there isn't any way you can miss the fact that those two things are different. You might not like it. You might choke on it. You might say, I don't want it. 
But there it is. And that is the fundamental, unavoidable secret to, Bible, to understand in the Bible. When you have God the Holy Spirit as your teacher, he'll take his words that he wrote on the pages in the Bible, preserve them for you. You'll take a King James Bible. You'll ask who said it, who did he say it to, when did he say it. You'll read it literally. You'll compare verses in your Bible. And then you'll recognize the disp dispensational distinction between prophecy and mystery. And when you do that, you'll be able to get a grasp on God's word that is unshakable. Without dispensational Bible study, the Bible is a confusing, hopeless hodgepodge, and it's like going to a smorgasbord. When you rightly divide it, you get a grasp of it. Now next time, in our next study, we're going to begin to take apart how you do this, how you study it rightly divided. You can understand God's Word for yourself. And when you do, you have the most exciting thing in the world happens because the Word of God works effectually in you that believe. It all starts with having God the Holy Spirit as your teacher. That starts when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Rely exclusively on Him as the Savior He died and rose again to be. And when you trust Him and nothing else to be your Savior, God then, the Holy Spirit, comes and moves in and brings you His life. Thanks for being with us today. Till next time. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us today. If you are still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven, and that you have eternal life as a present possession, let us know, and we'll be happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. That address again is The Message of Grace, P.O. Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today, and God's best until we meet next time for another Message of Grace. Took the blame, and then I cry, what wonderful grace, what wonderful grace, he did it all, oh praise his name.